and a rich research interest are gender, religious, and politics, and post-colonial migration of North American African Jews. So, it's okay, we can start. Thank yeah. you, Karine. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Karine, <coughs> and the organizers, and you to be here. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Professor Eliezer Ben Raphael, who will talk about uh, multiculturalism, uh, the Israeli perspective. He's a professor emeritus of sociology at uh, Tel Aviv University, and actually he has been already presented. So if you if you can excuse me, maybe I'll, because we are very short on time, and you have uh, his vitae, and uh, we did already present him. So I'll give him immediately the the stage. Thank you, professor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gone with it. Okay. You hear me? It's okay. To begin with, let us state that Zionism is new nationhood, or more accurately, the ideology of Jewish nation nationhood a crucial element in achieving uh, its objective is the adoption of Hebrew as the legitimate national tongue. The task of crafting classical Hebrew into a spoken vernacular succeeded in Israel, a quite a singular achievement, because the memory of Jews almost everywhere acknowledged Hebrew as the original tongue. The use of Hebrew indicated Zionism's aspiration to be the heir of the Jewish history. This linguistic shift that engendered a new culture served the Jacobine national integration ideology. However, the desire for linguistic and cultural unification contributed not only to unity, but also to society's further divisiveness. The call for unification implied, indeed, recognition of the status of those who portrayed the relevant models worthy of imitation by all, and these were the generation, the pioneer generation, and its sons and daughters. These children of the pioneers who carried the, burn, the, bur, the bulk of security burden were indeed conscious of representing a new type of Jew who had served, who had never known the diaspora. Israeli culture, however, underwent profound change over the years. In the wake of demographic, economic, and political transformations, collectivism as long, that long prevailed was to compromise with the growing individualization of life and the growth of a middle class. Immigration multiplied the population and brought with it a broad ar array of cultural groups. This immigration, as well it should be emphasized, Israel's wars also strengthened the relation with the Jewish diaspora from Israel's point of view. Israel's approchement to Western-style modernity is another factor in this transformation. The 1948 generation that fought for independence became bureaucrats, 
politicians, business people. Meritocracy organized social hierarchies. And the original disdain for foreign languages disappeared as English became de facto the country's second language at all levels of education and in professional life. Conjunctively, youth, like elsewhere, tends to lean to materialistic hedonism and to slacken its identification with collective causes. On the other hand, belligerence with neighbors has been a focus of tremendous developments and it relates and keeps alive the identi identity question that lies at the heart of this society. That is the definition of Israel as a Jewish state. This belligerence represents, in the eyes of the many, the continuation under new circumstances of Jews' long experience of exclusion. A Jewish state is intended to bring about solution to this experience. But in practice, this ambition brings its, uh, the, this ambition brings it to confront harsh dilemmas of its own. The Declaration of Independence defines the country as a Jewish state as well as a democracy. Though defining the notion of Jewish, Jewishness, as attached to the state is by no means an easy task, as most Israeli Jews, like most Jews everywhere, are not religious. Yet, despite this fact, there is no way to completely detach Jewishness from any link to the Jewish religion. And the divergent interpretation of this link are numerous. The acuteness of the debates in this respect reside in the constitutional implications in the framework of a state. Who are the Jews that Israel refers to when assessing itself as a Jewish state? The non-observant population is at varying degrees responding to Jewish traditional symbols, but as a rule, aspires to a Western-like type of secularization. And this sets it in confrontation with various social segments. The Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox, about 8 to 9 percent of the population, are primarily interested in advancing projects of flow inspired by religious Talmudic rulings. Such projects, they contend, are the only guarantee that Israel would not only be a state of Jews, but also a Jewish state. While they reside in neighborhoods of their own, for the most, the leaders are involved in harsh political combats at the center of the political life. For the national religious, what primarily matters is the expansion of West Bank settlements. They understand Zionism in terms of redemption and view the West Bank as Jewish land by the power of the biblical promise. According to them, any concession over the promised land is a betrayal of Israel's commitment to Judaism. These tensions cannot be viewed as temporary. They are fueled by the inability 
of the secular to respond efficiently to both kinds of claims. Zionism, under any shade, it is to remember, draws its symbols from religious historical traditions. Hence, complete separation of religion and state in Israel is difficult to conceive, which finally accounts for the permanence of the confrontations between religious and secular publics. Other cleavages relate to ethnic allegiances. We think of part of the population of Middle Eastern and North African origins, the Mizrahi, Russian speakers, or Ethiopians. Many Mizrahim, for instance, especially in lower social strata, stick to some traditions of theirs, as expressing in this manner some aloofness from the mainstream society. Russian-speaking immigrants from the former Soviet Union are characterized by allegiance to the original language and culture. This population numbers a relatively large contingent of non-Jews, according to traditional law, about 25%, who mostly assimilate to the Jewish environment. Ethiopian Jews, a much smaller group, insert a new element in the human composition of Israeli society that needs impediment of their own on the way to absorption. Cases like these for of like these, and they are not the whole list, formulate their own claims justifying the retention of particularism and challenging the Zionist aspiration to unification. No few Mizrahim find still difficult to abandon in the land of the Jews practices they maintain for centuries as markers of Jewishness. The difficulty is especially voiced by ultra-Orthodox Mizrahim like Shas. Russian Jews like all others, aspire to be full Israeli Jews, but without renouncing their linguistic and cultural capital. Ethiopian Jews are see, see their legacies as forms of Jewishness that together with the adoption of local symbols of Judaism justify the self-assertion as Jews and fuel the sensitivity to any form of discrimination. Furthermore, since Israel is defined as the state of the Jews, people who belong to different religions fall here into the category of others. It is only because Israel also professed to be democratic they belong to a we of a sort as well. Here too, to be sure, one runs into dilemmas of and complex debates. The most important of these others, I won't make the, the detail because of uh, what you say, but let's remember that we have Muslims, Christian, Arabs, Druze, and, and also some a new group that is not to be forgotten, the former workers that arrive here and tend to stay despite the temporary status. Let's say that while Arab and Jews represent the non-Jewish Israeli, foreign workers fill the slot of non-Jewish non-Israelis. In principle, 
This issue of the presence of others should not as such be an obstacle to democracy. We know, for instance, that in Great Britain, Anglicanism is state religion in spite of the fact that millions of nationals, possibly a majority, belong to other faiths. Though the UK is also the case that numberless rulings neutralize the inconveniences of not belonging to the dominant group and asserts civil egalitarian rights of all leaving safe the image of England as the mother of modern democracy. This might be a model for Israel, but most probably only when circumstances change and above all the Mashiach comes, that is, that peace reaches the shores of this part of the Mediterranean Sea, making superfluous the present state of social mobilization of the Jewish population. It is then assumedly that it is then assumedly that democracy and Jewish state would not be in conflict anymore despite the endemic divergences. To question now the kind of, and let's, let me finish this, yes, I'm sorry. To question now the kind of multiculturalism illustrated by Israel for the time being. The incoherence of the forces in presence yields the impression that Israel is an atomized society that defines any consistent ordering. Though it is also to be acknowledged that most groups which make up this multiculturalism are not discrete entities that challenge each other head on. Hence, for instance, followers of the national religious persuasion may be Mizrahim or Russians and may have as such diversified interest. Moreover, the disruptive significance of cleavages is often buffered by in-between categories and many individuals are offsprings. Offspring of mixed, uh, mixed Ashkenazi Mizrahi, Mizrahi Russian or Ethiopian national religious marriages. These unions tend, of course, to blur, to blur the divisive line between categories. Similarly, Jews and stand between Jews and Arabs, and among Arabs, Christians are closer to the Jews' models. To, to conclude, <laughs> Israel's multiculturalism does not eradicate concerns with general national interests, but mostly combine them with ideological and purely political preoccupations. In the chaotic galeidoscope that make up protagonists, that, that they make up, protagonists appear here not only as striving with the political center for specific interests, but also for influencing the social order at large. The stability of this society, in the measure that it is stable, is not accounted for by the absence, the absence of conflictual parties, but by the multiplic multiplication and the divergences that to some extent neutralize each other. This relative stability explains that for Israelis in general, this chaos of forces appears as a gestalt, that is a configuration of elements that seems to possess attributes that are no one of its different components. Elements that appear ensemble, that is, together. 
and which because of this are perceived as un ensemble, that is one all. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll do the same thing that you did this morning. That is, uh, we'll take the question afterwards. Okay. Is it okay with you? No problem. That's fine. Thank you. So I would like to introduce now uh, Professor Vic uh, Satskevich. Sorry. Almost, almost there. He's a professor of sociology at McMaster University in, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And uh, he got his PhD at the University of Glasgow and studied lots of things about immigration, race, and ethnic relations. His books include Racism and the Incorporation of Foreign Labor, The Ukrainian Diaspora, uh, I'm just mm -hmm. taking uh, uh, randomly some of them. Racism in Canada and race and ethnic relations in Canada. His most recent book is a study of, can, of how Canadian visa officers, you know how uh, bureaucratic those people could be, make decisions and is based on extensive fieldwork at Canada's overseas visa offices. So we'll let you talk for 15 minutes. I have a, a very accurate uh, <laughs> timer here. And uh, thank you, Vic, for uh, presenting us your paper. OK, thank you. So to change the slides. Yes. I'll tell you when it's four minutes okay. and zero, OK? Okay, uh, great. So thank you. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, this is my uh, second trip to Israel, and I don't know if you know this, but you have really good fruit here. Like it's <laughs> delicious. Yeah, so you know that. Okay. Uh, not all, of course. Uh, and so actually, uh, I think some of my conclusions are actually going to be fairly similar to Professor Ben Raphael, so I think we're heading in the same direction. And so as you know, uh, multicultural policies uh, around the world have been kind of under attack, uh, and, and political leaders in obviously Germany and Britain and other countries have been uh, raising serious questions about the wisdom of multicultural policies and in fact uh, have declared them a failure. Uh, and what I'm going to do in my brief time here today is give you uh, what I call a cautiously optimistic uh, success story uh, of Canadian multiculturalism. And uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't uh, throw, uh, be too quick to throw multiculturalism uh, out as a as an approach to immigrant integration, and I think there's actually good empirical evidence to support that uh, claim. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving you an overview of Canadian uh, multiculturalism or multiculturalism in Canada. Some of you may know this uh, stuff already, but I think it's worth uh, just giving you a brief thumbnail uh, sketch. Uh, it was a policy introduced by the federal government in 1971, and it uh, took the form eventually in 1988 of a formal multiculturalism act. And so that act continues to exist, and it continues to provide kind of a uh, guidance about how Canada deals with diversity. And I think uh, as uh, many who many of us in Canada who study multiculturalism, uh, it's pretty clear that there's been a shifting emphasis in the in the official meaning of the policy, and 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 it that the meaning of the policy changes uh, and has changed over the course of its uh, history, uh, from when it was first introduced to the late 1970s. I think it's uh, there was an emphasis on what was called ethnicity multiculturalism and, a, and the promotion of kind of culture for culture's sake and, the, and a lot of emphasis uh, placed in the policy 
on the promotion of language, uh, the ethnic languages, ethnic cultural kind of practices, and, and it was called sort of song and dance uh, multiculturalism. In the late 1970s uh, until the early to mid 1990s, the policy shifted to what was called kind of uh, uh, equity multiculturalism. And the shift there really involved a greater interest in issues of racism and tackling racism and discrimination. So a, quite a noticeable uh, shift. Then a uh, third shift uh, uh, was evident in the mid 1990s uh, to what's called civic multiculturalism. And at that time, uh, the policy emphasis was on uh, civic integration, getting uh, newcomers to participate more in Canadian society, uh, uh, politically, in civic organizations, and so on. And then today, I think the emphasis is really on what's called integrative multiculturalism. And I think the emphasis there is tends to be on the promotion of Canadian values and, and the greater attachment of newcomers to Canadian uh, uh, interests. I think one of the interesting things about the policy, though, is that it's a policy without enabling regulations. And, and for those of you that uh, I'm not a political scientist, but basically, I think multicultural policy is interesting to contrast with immigration policy in Canada. So immigration policy, there's the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and then there's a very detailed set of regulations that are drafted that guide bureaucrats in terms of how they should implement that act. Multiculturalism is different. It's, 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 there's a multiculturalism act, but there's no detailed regulations. There's no sort of specific guidance that bureaucrats can refer to in order to implement the policy. And I think that that gives the policy a certain amount of flexibility and uh, uh, helps explain the changes in meaning. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, Quebec, of course, is a little bit different. Uh, Quebec has a policy of interculturalism. There are others in the room that uh, have greater expertise in uh, interculturalism and the debates there, Jack among, uh, among them. Uh, and the policy in Quebec tends to emphasize or acknowledge the value of cultural differences, but the, there's this greater expectation that uh, newcomers have an obligation to integrate and accept the primacy of French language and culture and to observe kind of prevailing norms. And you've no doubt heard about some of the more heated debates in, in Canada and Quebec recently. There was a reasonable accommodation debate. Uh, and uh, more recently, the debate about the Charter of Quebec values. And so, as I say, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on that, because there's others uh, here that, uh, and uh, these are complicated issues. Uh, I think the even though uh, I think there's still strong, fairly strong support for multiculturalism in many different sectors of Canadian society, uh, it has been a policy that has been subject to repeated criticisms over the course of its existence. And I think uh, the early critics of multiculturalism, uh, mainly on the left, mainly on the political left, kind of interestingly enough, argued that the policy was too weak. Uh, and did not really help what it, uh, did not uh, improve what it claimed uh, to do. And so I think that the early critics really sort of focused on the weaknesses of the policy and it not being effective enough. And so those criticisms involved that the idea that multiculturalism only promoted symbolic ethnicity, it didn't promote a deeper understanding of culture and, and, and ethnicity and only focused on superficial dimensions of uh, ethnicity. Uh, but I think more uh, seriously also, uh, there was this argument that multiculturalism didn't really challenge the fundamental power inequalities within Canadian society, nor did it really do much to challenge racism and discrimination. And so the policy was really criticized for being too weak. I think the other set of critics kind of interestingly enough, 
made the exact opposite argument that the policy was problematic because it was too too successful uh, and too strong and that these critics argued that it undermined attachment to Canada it allowed the importation of old world conflicts into the country and promoted uh, ethnic ghettos of various uh, kinds both geographically and psychologically I think now in kind of a post 9-11 world the, those critics have uh, been bolstered uh, by the concern about uh, terrorism and transnationalism. And I think uh, in Canada, religion has argu arguably replaced ethnicity and race as the main concern of uh, inter related to integration. Uh, in the 1990s, much of the uh, concern in Canada about multiculturalism and immigration was about uh, black immigration to Canada and black immigrants from the Caribbean. The the concern was that they're too they're involved in criminality and they're not integrating and so on and so forth. With 9/11, that concern completely went away politically. Uh, that there's almost no political debate about black immigration anymore. And obviously, Muslims and Muslim uh, integration has kind of uh, overtaken the the, the debate. The other sort of bundle of criticisms are, are, are kind of new ways of articulating some of the old ones that people say that multiculturalism promotes unhealthy transnational ties, that it promotes the spread of illiberal values, promotes uh, segregation, and uh, uh, a new sort of twist on this one is by a Canadian historian, Jack Granitstein, who argues that multiculturalism promotes uh, or distorts Canadian foreign policy. And his argument is that ethnic and religious communities lobby the federal government in support of so-called homeland interests that may not necessarily be in the national interest. And I, I don't necessarily buy that, but I think that's the uh, argument. So let me just quickly turn to the substance uh, of my talk. And I really just want to make three kind of points about uh, the, the, the issue of multiculturalism in Canada today. I think the first point is that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, there's actually a lot of support for immigration uh, in Canada. As a lot of people have recognized, that there are no real serious anti-immigrant political parties or credible social movements. There are some white supremacist movements in Canada but their membership probably numbers in the dozens, maybe hundreds. It's not, you know, super significant. Um, and, and so I think that the multiculturalism as a policy has some role to play in explaining the strong support for immigration. Um, but I don't think it explains everything. I think that credit should go to our lucky geography. So obviously we share a land border with the US and the US doesn't produce a lot of refugees. And so, uh, uh, and it's also very difficult for boatloads of refugees to get to Canada from Asia and, and other places, right? They do actually get there. And when they do, you see that support for immigration actually drops. Uh, and so when that happens, uh, uh, the the cracks in the the support for immigration uh, are there, but I think our geography protects us from a lot of undocumented immigration. I think the other thing that uh, helps explain the support for immigration is that our source countries are relatively diverse. So China, India, and the Philippines are major are heavy hitters in our immigration program today. So. We admit about 270,000 immigrants per year uh, on an annual basis, so it's fairly significant. About 50 or 60 percent of those immigrants come from those three countries, but the other sources are fairly diverse, right? So that we get immigrants from France and Britain and the U.S. and and I think that that sort of you know to use Margaret Thatcher's uh, horrible old term from uh, the 80s there's not this feeling that we're being swamped by one particular immigrant community, right? And so that diversity, I think, helped dampens down this, the potential anti-immigrant feelings. The argument uh, that I'm making next is not popular among my, my, my sort of uh, colleagues who are, are 
uh, critical of immigration policy, but I actually think that some credit should go to our immigration department for maintaining uh, it, that they're partially uh, responsible for maintaining some of the support for immigration through their pretty strong enforcement uh, mechanisms. And I think that uh, we do have a fairly significant uh, element of our immigration policy related to enforcement and enforcing the policy and making sure that folks who do come to Canada come legally. Uh, and I think that that tends to reinforce Canadians' confidence in the immigration system. And when folks have confidence in the immigration system, I think that that also helps contribute to its uh, support. But I think multiculturalism also plays its role in that it helps to create a kind of an ideological climate that helps to create a positive public discourse about immigration. Uh, and that much of our positive public Im discourse about immigration is related to immigrants being necessary for the economy and, and, and for demographic purposes and so on. And so I think multicultural policy should get some of the credit for the support for immigration. Um, I was going to talk a bit about the issue of racism and I, I'm going to skip over this very quickly. Uh, I think that despite some of the successes with the policy, one of the areas where the policy hasn't been that successful is with dealing with issues of racism. Uh, and this is a table from one of the surveys that Jack's organization has done. And what it shows is that, you know, even despite a, a, a long history of multicultural policy in place, uh, that there's still a fairly significant level of sort of everyday personal racism that is articulated by uh, ordinary Canadians. And again, um, although I don't think that this is a failure of the policy in the sense that I'm not sure that we can really educate people out of their racist beliefs. I think that as Michael Banton argued a number of years ago, it's far more effective and it's far easier to change people's behavior than it is to change their attitudes. And so I think as a, as a policy mechanism, you can make life difficult for racists by preventing them or making it difficult for them to act on the basis of their negative beliefs, but you're not really gonna change their beliefs all that much. And I don't think we can blame multiculturalism for that. And this is really the punchline uh, of my presentation is that I think a lot of the evidence actually in Canada points to the fact that immigrants actually do integrate. And I know that integration is a complicated concept to measure and I don't, I'm, I don't have, you know, I, I wasn't going to bombard you with the data. Uh, but actually the policy and the promotion of difference does lead to integration and perhaps even to uh, assimilation. And this is where, you know, uh, you're going to have to trust me. Uh, that, that the data does actually uh, exist. Uh, but there's actually a very high level of uh, citizenship acquisition. Newcomers want to become Canadian citizen sh citizens. And I think the rate is something like 86% of newcomers actually take out Canadian citizenship, which is you know, quite remarkable. Uh, there's actually a fairly high level of political involvement uh, on the part of immigrants and visible minorities, that political parties court immigrants, they court newcomers, and they newcomers stand for elections in uh, federal and provincial ridings. Municipally, I think there's a bit more of a problem. There's a fairly high level of, uh, level of English acquisition. There's growing rates of intermarriage. There's, and actually there's a lot of evidence to show that there's a strong attachment, immigrants display a strong attachment to Canada as at the same time as they uh, display a strong attachment to their cultural and religious identity and the two aren't necessarily incompatible. And then finally, I think when you look at the second generation, uh, the children of immigrants often outperform Canadian born uh, children uh, educationally. So they're, you know, by every measure of education or achievement, immigrant children tend to do very, very well in Canadian uh, society. Um, what could I say in one minute if I have that? Um, 
and this is where I think I, I agree with Professor Ben Raphael, is that immigrants and newcomers will always make claims for recognition and that the existence of multiculturalism policy doesn't change that. But I think what multicultural policy does is give newcomers and host societies a space to deal with those changes in kind of in respectful, and even though it's not easy, uh, that multiculturalism opens up a space for negotiation uh, of those claims. And I think that's one of the uh, probably benefits of uh, multicultural policy is that it allows for those kinds of, it, it, it provides a politically acceptable forum for people to negotiate those claims. So I'll stop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vic, for this uh, quick uh, and uh, to the, up to the point uh, presentation. I would like now to introduce uh, Dr. Svetlana Shashatisvili Bolotin. She's a lecturer at the Rapin uh, Academic Center in Netanya and holds a PhD in sociology and anthropology from Tel Aviv University. Uh, she works essentially on migration, social stratification, sociology of education, and research methods. She is now the head of a research and evaluation department in the education division at the municipality of Ashdod in Israel. Thank you, Svetlana. You have 15 minutes. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here today. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Benny. I'm happy to be here today and to, I'm sorry, I'm happy to be here today and to present the collaborative work with Sabina Lisica. I'm Svetlana Cicisvili Balotin. And as you can see and hear, I'm also an immigrant, but not from Canada or France. I immigrated from the former Soviet Union. Today I am going to present our research regarding religiosity, regarding the case of integration of Western immigrants in the Israeli secondary educational system. And to our study we have two main purposes. The first purpose of the, our study was to examine the uh, differences in the matriculation eligibility among Western immigrants in the Israeli in the Israeli secondary education. And why do we need to speak about the matriculation eligibility among the Western immigrants? Because we know a matriculation eligibility in Israel today is a primary and perhaps even exclusive entry ticket to the higher education and to the labor market. Therefore, it's really very important to examine the proportion of eligibility among immigrants. And the second purpose of our study, oh my, and the second pur purpose of our study is to examine the factors that affect these uh, rates of matriculation eligibility among Western immigrants. And before I will present our results, I would like to to give a brief overview about the Western immigrants in the Israel, and then a brief review about the secondary education in Israel. As we can see here from the table, English speakers had on average higher educational background and also a higher economical background. And again, and also we can see that these immigrants immigrated from the mainly from the religious fam families. French speakers, as we can see here, had an average educational, educational background. About economical background, we can speak about the middle class, and they, ha they ha have an average plus economical background, and they arrived 
to Israel from the traditional and religious families. Regarding the Spanish speakers, they arrived uh, from the secular families and they had an average high educational level and uh, an average uh, economical background and they arrived to Israel mainly to improve the economical background. So what's about the educational system in, in Israel in the Jewish sector? Today I would like to speak about the Jewish sector in Israel. And as we know, in the Jewish sector in Israel, we have three types of affiliation. State affiliation, state schools, state religious affiliation, and we can speak about the ultra-Orthodox affiliation. State, really, state schools are educational institutions without a religious orientation. Most of the, of the students in these schools come from, as we can see here, from secular and traditional families. And in, in, in these schools, the curricula includes mainly include in this school curricula include mainly matriculation uh, subjects like science subjects and also Jewish sub uh, subjects, but in the secular way, if you can say. And in this school, we have about 70% of matriculation eligibility among 12th grade students. Some words about state religious schools. These schools also taught both religious subjects and they also taught uh, so matriculation subjects like science, uh, math, and English. And in these schools, we have about 70% of matriculation eligibility. In contrast, if you can see in ultra-Orthodox schools, in this school, the curricula includes any few or any matriculation subjects like math and English. Therefore, in these schools, we have about only 10% of matriculation eligibility among 12, uh, 12 students. And now some about what? Among Jewish sector, we, we can see that about 70% of the students go to the state schools, about 14% go to the state religious, and around 17% go to the ultra-Orthodox schools. And again, it is very important to emphasize that we have a huge difference in the matriculation eligibility among state or state religious schools versus ultra-Orthodox schools. And this point is very important for us today. Due to the lack of time, I, I will skip to our data and uh, to our main findings, but I would like to mention two main theories, the assimilation theory and segmented assimilation theory. I will, I will speak about this uh, series later in, in, in my summary. So what's about our sample? Our sample conclude data from the Minister of Education about in the Jewish sector, about who attended 12th grade in the Israeli educational system in the 2010 and 2011 in three types of affiliation, state, state religious, and ultra-Orthodox school. In this point, it is very important to emphasize two points. The first point is that only now the Ministry of Education released the data of the 2012 years school. So it's the latest data we can, see, we can speak, and unfortunately, and now it's 2015. And the second point is also is very, important, very important to emphasize. If you want, I can share with you my presentation. It's OK. You don't need to, to, photograph, to photograph. It's OK. I can share my presentation without any problems. So, and the second point is, so the first point, uh, the first point was that this is the latest data, and the second point, that we are speaking about the 12th grade students in the Israeli education. So, we don't have information about dropouts, 
And this point is very important because 12th grade students, this is a, a selective group, and we need to remember this fact. Because especially among immigrants, the proportion of dropouts is very high. And I will be later to speak about this point. So 12th grade students, a selective group. So s some, some main points. So in our research, we have four groups. The first group is English speakers. So English speakers, those who immigrated, f I, I'm sorry, I'm speaking to, I'm sorry, but you need, and uh, I'm sorry, you're right. So the first, <laughs> so I, um, my God, oh. So the f first group is English speakers, those who immigrated mainly from Canada, uh, from Canada, uh, United States, and uh, or their, immig their parents immigrated from these countries. So we have the first generation of immigrants and the second generation of immigrants. French speakers uh, students, those who immigrated mainly from France, or their parents immigrated from France, again, the first and the second generation, we have Spanish speakers, those who immigrated from Spanish speakers countries, mainly from Argentina, again, the first and the second generation, and our comparison group is the third generation Israelis, those who were born in Israel and their parents were born in Israel. In our data, we don't speak about former Soviet Union and other groups like Eti Ethiopian and um, Etc. So, as we can see here, the point is that Western immigrants, in average, they are middle class regarding, for example, mother educational mean. So, the level of education of immigrants are high regarding the third generation of Israelis. But, as we can see here, it's the point is very important. The highest level of, mo of mother's education was among English speakers. However, as you can see here, the proportion of matriculation eligibility among English speakers are less than 50%, 49%. And we are speaking about the 12th grade students only. So the real proportion is significantly low, for example, among 19 years old. And as you can see, regarding the French speakers, we have only 53%. And now, our findings. As you can see, the green color is the second generation, and the orange color is the first generation. And as you can see here, for example, we can see that in the first generation, we have a really low proportion of matriculation eligibility. In the second generation, we have the picture is changed. And we can see, for example, that among Spanish immigrants, the proportion uh, is higher than in comparison to the third generation. But among the immigrants from English speakers or French speakers, the proportion is among English speakers, the there are no differences, significant differences between the first and the second generation, but among French speakers, and uh, French speakers, I'm sorry, and Spanish speakers, we can see the increase of the proportion. But again, the rates among immigrants, especially among two groups, those who immigrated both for the economical reason and for the traditional reason to Israel, the proportion of the matriculation eligibility is really low. And the question is, why? In this context, it's very important. It's OK. In this context, it's very important to emphasize that we have a differences among different affiliation regarding the matriculation eligibility. And as we can see here, for example, the proportion of 12th grade students in the ultra-Orthodox school streams as we can see, among the third generation, it's only less than 20%. However, among the English speakers, it's about 
40% of English speakers study in the ultra-Orthodox schools. And so we know in this school we have a really very, very low proportion of matriculation eligibility. Among the French speakers, we have also a higher proportion, less than English speakers, but again, a higher proportion. And among Spanish speakers, we have a really low proportion because they immigrated to improve the economical uh, situation and they from, uh, from non-religious families mainly. And, um, but as you know, it's only th this is the type of the, among the 12th grade students. But the main, but in the reality, the proportion of the students in the ultra-Orthodox schools is significantly higher. And this is the example among French speakers. So among students from the first grade to the 12th grade, all together, not only among the 12th grade students. And as we can see here from these pictures, the proportion of students who study, who attend ultra-Orthodox schools is more than 30%, and the proportion in the second generation, it's 34%. And we can understand why we have so low propo proportion of matriculation eligibility. I, I'm sorry, it's, it's really difficult to speak <laughs> to microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm laughing. And to, check our, and to check our hypothesis, it's two minutes only, and to check our hypothesis that the low proportion of matriculation eligibility among English speakers and among French speakers are due to choices of educational affiliation made by the groups, we run logistic regression. And the answer was really clear. But due to the lack of time, I will only want to present two figures for you. And you can understand the point. On the left, the first generation. On, on the right, the second generation. And as you can see here, for example, on the right, the second generation of immigrants, in the state and in state religious schools, the proportion of students from uh, Spain, uh, for example, English speakers in state, in state religious schools have the highest proportion of matriculation eligibility. Or also we have a high proportion among French speakers. However, please, ultra-Orthodox schools, we can see the proportion of matriculation eligibility in these schools among three groups, all three immigrant groups, is really very, very low. So the, the main point is the choice of educational stream. So the choice of educational affiliation impacts the matriculation eligibility. Therefore, we can say that religiosity plays a crucial role in the educational achievements among students, and especially among immigrant students from the Western countries, because they immigrated to Israel due to the religious purposes. And in Israeli case, this point is very important. So religiosity. And the last, uh, the, the last point, so in our st study, we, we describe two points. We speak about two points. The theoretical level, so we can speak about religiosity, segmented assimilation. So we have a classical segmented assimilation by Rembrandt and Portes, but we also can add not only economical and educational factor, but also the level of religiosity. And the second point is the policy level. In light of these findings, consideration should be given to formulating a policy about the integration of immigrant children in the Israeli educational system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Stay here with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, 
while uh, the panelists are uh, sitting and taking their places, we have a very interesting discussion about at least uh, two models of uh, multiculturalist uh, policies, the Israeli one and the Canadian one. And we have this uh, study which shows uh, how much religion is uh, preponderant, if I can say, uh, to, um, uh, to the education. So I, I'll do the same thing then this morning. We'll take um, questions and uh, we'll ask our panelists to answer after a, a first set of questions. Go ahead um, and present yourself. Okay, so most of you know me, my name is Oshra and I'm a member of the, I'm a member of the um, uh, European um, Institute for Immigration and Social Integration and also teach at the um, um, MA program. So hi everyone. Um, one comment and then a question. Sveta, I think you missed uh, a very important uh, opportunity to get into clash with some uh, new ministers in our parliament. If only you would show them that the second generation or even the first generation of French people going to orthodox school do uh, have higher opportunity or have higher probability to get the matriculation in comparison to third generation Israelis, if I got you right. Um, there was one slide. I'm not sure, but just if this is the case, then don't tell them. Um, <laughs> or you'll get some people very angry. Now to my question. Um, Professor Ben Rafael and um, Mr. Vic. Yeah, and Vic. Is that okay if I call you? You can Vic? call him Vic. It's always easier. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so you both had very interesting presentations, but I want to be a bit uh, provocative here and ask a general question about multiculturalism. I'm not an expert in Canadian immigration law, but the, the little I know um, tells me that um, financial situation of individuals wanting to immigrate to Canada plays a role. Of course. And I want to know whether you think we can actually talk about multiculturalism with this selectivity guiding this kind of claim. And in Israel, I think we have a similar problem because Israel may be a multicultural society, but then again, if you look at the law of return, we are hardly, hardly multicultural. I mean, in order to be an immigrant in Israel, you have to be Jewish first, right? So how multicultural is that? So I'm questioning the, um, the very basic assumption that you can actually use multiculturalism to describe both societies, basically. And having done that, I would like to um, challenge you both, maybe, in answering the following question. Um, my students know that because we just uh, discussed it in one of my classes. But uh, Jopke and also Koopmans, Ruth Koopmans, I don't know if you know their names. But both of them actually propose that um, multiculturalism may be nice for integration in terms of identity, cultural freedom, symbolic ethnicity, maybe, if you want. But if you look at the um, status of different groups of immigrants, living in multicultural societies, then ethnic inequality is bound to be the outcome. And if you look at the more assimilating societies, ethnic inequality is at least hopefully reduced in the third, in the second, sometimes even generations. So I'm wondering whether we can really speak about multiculturalism and its advantages in light of these comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes? Hi, um, I'm Amandine. I'm a PhD student um, in geography, and I have a question for Professor Satsevich. Um, yeah? <laughs> she got your name right. <laughs> um, I was wondering uh, if you had any examples, maybe at state or city levels, of more proactive policies or regulations, working procedures or programs. Uh, that would enforce multiculturalism, as you said, that the federal policy is more of a weak policy. And if yes, what do they understand by multiculturalism? Is there a different approach of what it is than the federal um, policy? Thank you. Maybe with those two big questions, we can start uh, around here. What do you think? Do you want to give a? Yes, if you want. Sure. Sure, go ahead. 
there are effectively many definitions <coughs> of what the concept of multiculturalism means. I, I, I don't, there are many normative definitions in the sense that multicultural, multiculturalism should be this and this. And others that say, unfortunately, multiculturalism is this and this and that. I, I tend to be, I try to be sociologist and to give some kind of matter of fact definition. For me, multiculturalism is the very existence of different communities or different, let's say, groups of population that asserts by their activity, by language, by the markers, by the clothes, by the food, uh, some kind of singularity that relates to what they understand as the, the culture. That means that for me, multiculturalism, at the difference from Canada, probably, or in part, is not a top-down phenomena, is a bottom-up phenomena. And in fact, multiculturalism developed in Israel from the bottom against the Jacobinian melting pot ideology. And because of its political impacts, it has imposed itself on the political arena. And nowadays, if you look at the Knesset, you see that a substantial part of the members in parliament, the central political institution of the country, are representatives of cultural, socio-cultural communities. Russians, Arabs, of course, ultra-Orthodox, of course, and, and, and uh, all kinds. So, uh, uh, now a new, a new, <laughs> a new socio-cultural entity, the settlers, they also have their own culture and assert themselves. So, in, in etc. And, and maybe, maybe also the French will get that when they get a bit more numerous, reach the rough of, let's say, 80,000, 100,000 people, they will be like the Ethiopians in final analysis. And the Ethiopians are definitely, uh, 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 this, respond definitely to this. You see, that means, now, what I want to say is that multiculturalism does not necessarily erase the feeling of belonging to the whole. The, the fact that you are Israeli and not German, not French, not American, is quite visible when you, 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 you work on the Champs Elysees. You see, this is an Israeli. That means you have markers of Israeliness. The Israeliness is not erased because people are also French Israelis, Russian Israelis, etc., etc. So that is what I want to say. Thank you. Vic? Okay, so uh, the first question about uh, economic selectivity, I think you're right uh, that Canada does uh, a priority within Canada's immigration program is to select people with uh, high levels of human capital, education, and wealth. Uh, but that's not the only part of the story uh, because a significant part of the immigration program is made up of people who aren't selected for those uh, criteria, and those are family class and refugees, and they make up about 40% uh, of the total flow. And even among the way that the immigration department counts economic class immigrants, they count family members 
as economic class. So even though one, the, the primary applicant is selected on the basis of these attributes, the spouses aren't necessarily selected on that basis. So I think it's a little bit inflated, this idea that all of immigration to Canada is economically selective. At the same time, I actually, I actually agree with you that, um, you know, because immigrants, the economic immigrants who come to Canada are selected <coughs> on the basis of their education, their, their, their financial capital, I think we tend to overestimate the amount of diversity that they bring. I think that there's a lot of class homogeneity uh, that immigrants bring, uh, and that you know when you focus on social class, <coughs> when you focus on social class, um, uh, I don't think that those are th th that. Th <laughs> I think that that tends to trump a lot of the supposed ethnic diversity. So I think there's sort of a superficial sense that because someone looks different, they must be diverse. But that hides that that homogeneity in terms of class composition, which I think is a good point. Um, the issue of multiculturalism doesn't do anything to address economic inequalities. Uh, I, I actually would agree with that. I think that uh, multi multicultural policies aren't a be-all and end-all. They don't solve every problem. And I think that um, you know, I think that multicultural policies have to be coupled with fairly strong anti-discrimination uh, uh, policies, strong human rights uh, approaches. And there are problems in Canada with those kinds of things. But I think that um, uh, they exist and, and that there's a, a willingness to, to think about and enforce uh, human rights uh, issues. And, and so without that, I think multicultural policy, really, you're right, it doesn't really address those kinds of economic inequalities. Although at the same time, I think that the empirical evidence shows, and you know, Jack brought uh, a copy of the classic book about ethnic inequality in Canada, The Vertical Mosaic in Canada, uh, that we actually wrote the new introduction for. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, for a lot of, in the 1960s, uh, there was this idea that Canada was a vertical mosaic and that immigrants from uh, uh, outside of, of Northern Europe and, and Britain faced discrimination. Uh, but the story, I think, for, for European immigrants and their children has been one of upward mobility. And similarly, I think that that story is being replayed for visible minority immigrants, although it's a little bit, it's complicated by group. So I think that there is uh, evidence of upward mobility and whether multiculturalism uh, is responsible, I, I don't know. And then finally, examples. I actually think, like I'm not a big fan of banks, uh, but I think banks, have uh, been among the more successful institutions that have adopted diversity, multicultural kind of principles. And they do it because it's profitable, right? That, you know, you recruit a more diverse workforce, you recruit people that can speak different languages because that's the way that they can get business. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a market kind of approach to uh, diversity, right? And so banks, I think, are, in a weird sort of way, a success story of, of uh, multiculturalism. And I think police forces are. I do a lot of work on police. And there's problems with the police uh, in Canada, as there are with other places. But I do think that uh, they have a, uh, many forces have a genuine commitment to diversifying their, uh, their services. Thank you, Vic. Uh, Svetlana? So, thank you, Ashrat, for your question. So, I hope that maybe, Thanks. you know, the new, the new parliament, new government, but maybe during these days we will have st st state ultra orthodox schools. And maybe this is a solution for, for the situation. I hope. 
but who knows? Thank you. Thank you. More questions? I take two, and, and that would be it. Two, three, and then we'll have lunch. So yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Do I need to start from the beginning? No, it's again? fine. Okay. We heard. Um, so you made a comment about the different mm -hmm. politics of the different countries and mm -hmm. multiculturalism. And usually the people that are making the policies monopolize on anything that they have that they can claim as multicultural. So like I know in America that there were studies done of black communities that went and voted for Obama purely because he was black not because he was, you know, agreed with their politics. We had in Israel that I, that one of the candidates, you know, campaigned mostly in Russian and targeted the Russian population. And most of them also didn't agree with his politics, but it was a Russian speaker. And I feel that when, like, do you feel that in Canada and also here in Israel that when you're using you're using your multiculturalism to gain power does that end up helping the multiculturalism or does it end up hurting it because they're not doing it for genuine reasons to help with multiculturalism they're just doing it to acquire power thank you thank you which is already something if those communities can acquire power this is already something i should say but um Yes, the other question here, please. Can you introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Hi. I'm Talia. I'm a first year student at, uh, at Rupin. I'm originally from Toronto. Um, you know, I've, been to, I've traveled to a few different countries, and I've, I was raised in, until I moved to Israel uh, about seven years ago. And just a few minutes from my house, if you walk, there's a street. All the stores are Iranian. If you walk the street over, it's all Chinese. If you walk to the next street, it's all Russian. Like, I mean, every street, every even area has its own, its, own, its own culture, its own people. And I think it's really hard to find that in other countries in the world. Um, I also started university at York. And I know when my mom went there <laughs> many years ago, it was mostly a Jewish university, and they, they, they had off Jewish holidays. And now there's huge racism there. And I think that, I think, you know, people always talk about all the French moving to Israel because of anti Semitism. And people sort of forget about other places that there's racism everywhere. And I think, I know, I, I didn't move here mainly because of Zionism. I didn't move here really also because of racism. But I think it's important for people to sort of, understand that racism is everywhere and Zionism is not the number one reason for people to move here and I, I was just doing an assignment the other day and um, and your question yeah no it's sort of a comment I was doing a, an assignment the other day and I, I was writing a sentence and I said I'm a, a Canadian Israeli and I said no I, maybe I'm an Israeli Canadian and I, I I called my mother and I said what am I I really your Couldn't mother should know. <laughs> I don't know. I said, she, I don't know. The, the question is for her mother. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> the question is for your mother, yeah. not for you to ask. <laughs> no, so it's something I always think about. And so the question? The question. Is the question. This is the question. OK, we'll tell you. <laughs> no, no, the question is. Sorry. Is. And one more comment, sort of more of a comment. <laughs> also in Canada, like you, you were talking about banks being, I agree with you, and also go to, do your, go to renew your Canadian passport. I mean, who renews it for you? Have you ever had a born Canadian <laughs> renew it? I never. When you land at the airport, I've also mentioned it in class before, there's a huge sign, welcome to Canada. Chinese, a, a, a black person, a, ch no, it's not a problem. I'm just saying, go to another country and you won't find it. All right. No, you won't. OK, so we will, yeah, last comment is uh, Jack. She, he has a question. My question was, uh, 
can we have a can we have the the mic? Sorry. Okay, Jack. Yeah. So my Thank question is for Svetlana. Uh, a very yes. quick comment. By in Quebec, actually, in the ultra orthodox schools, right, closer. No, not closer. Not closer. In the ultra orthodox schools in Quebec, we've actually had some issues that have made media attention because the curriculum, the the government required curriculum, is not being followed by certain ultra orthodox schools. Right, and it creates a lot of tension between those schools and the government. And the government's very concerned sometimes of being accused of being anti-Semitic if, if it encroaches too much on you know, the way those schools function. But my, my feeling about it, or my understanding, and this I was asking Kareen before, is a lot of people who go to these ultra-Orthodox schools, they know that, their, that math and various other matriculation-related courses are not going to be uh, emphasized or offered, in fact, at all, in any meaningful way. So they do this in good conscience, in some ways, knowing that the rates of matriculation are going to be lower. Right? They're not sort of going, I, I, I don't know, this is where, I, you know, I, I need, I'm trying to understand if the choices they're making are, despite the effects it's having that you're demonstrating, are not choices they're making sort of freely, knowing what they're getting into. Yeah, well, the parents are doing it freely, but the kids right. are not. <laughs> the children are just, you know, they but are... That's a hard... Yeah. That puts you in a very hard yeah, moral very, very position. Very difficult situation. Because then you have to override yeah. the parents and say that, you know... Yeah. It's, that's what I'm not following, because that's, yeah. you know... It's that's, kind of like people who say, look, a, a lot of Muslims, they don't want to wear the... Uh, hijab or something else, they're being forced to wear it by their parents. Are you going yeah, to override those, you know? In the case of, 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 of children, it's different. Okay, so I'll give another round of answers here. Uh, sh should we take another one? Another, another question? The last question? Okay, the last question there. Go ahead. Yeah, louder and... One thousand Jews from Israel. Where are from Israel? One thousand refugees from Israel. One thousand refugees. Okay, the Palestinians. Asylum? No, not uh, Palestinians, but asylum seekers who have been undocumented people in Israel. Excuse me, please, please, can you let him speak, please? Okay, go ahead. I, I will do it. Uh, I will speak it again. Uh, as Canada is uh, uh, absorbing a lot of refugees from all over the world. They uh, have an experience, and uh, uh, the Israeli government don't have a policy to absorb refugees. So, if you have an advice, or okay, an advice to the Israeli government to, to absorb <laughs> refugees. All right. So, Vic, I think this is a big. Uh, <laughs> and yes, and uh, Professor Ben Raphael, maybe he will he will tell us. Okay, a last round for the panelists, and uh, we'll be off uh, for lunch. What was my question? Uh, maybe you can give an advice to the Israeli government about refugees. <laughs> about <laughs> refugees? <laughs> I don't know what advice we can give to the Israeli government. I think that Israel has the highest percentage of people that are or that originate from a population of refugees. You had uh, several hundred thousand refugees from the Holocaust, and you had uh, even a bigger number of people that were refugees from uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And when, <laughs> if you scrap a bit our skin, you will find a refugee. So what, what, what uh, advice should I give? Nowadays, we have a problem. 
we have a problem because our success to become really uh, uh, economically, economically, not we are not that successful in every every area, but economically, we are an attractive focus for people from the third world. But we, 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 we th this contradicts our uh, aspiration to be a Jewish state and to be a democracy, not to have non-Jews becoming uh, 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 too numerous too segment of the population that would endanger the character of Israel as a Jewish state. So the only advice that we can give is they do it, they try to do it, and sometimes with methods that we do not necessarily uh, accept or, or but, but, uh, but what is to be done as far as possible is that uh, to show that there are other attractive places in this world. Thank you. Vic? Um, well, this, I mean, the story of Canada and refugees is, is complicated. I think there's kind of a, there's a good news, bad news kind of thing. I think that, um, you know, compared to 15 years ago, uh, we accept far fewer refugees today uh, than we did uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And so there has been, uh, even in Canada, hardening of, of kind of, of uh, policy mechanisms related to refugees. So it's not nirvana by, by any uh, stretch. Um, and, and I'm... Uh, like I'm loath to give advice about policy because people don't listen to me anyway. But um, <laughs> I mean, I think one of the one of the positive things about Canadian immigrant Canadian refugee policy is, uh, or one of the positive components of it is this notion of uh, privately sponsored refugees. And so the federal government allows groups of five people or more to get together. Uh, and sponsor uh, a refugee and kind of take responsibility for their uh, care and well-being for a year uh, when they come. And so to help them kind of integrate, learn the ropes and so on. And I think that also helps bring, build their networks and, and, and contacts. And so I, I actually kind of, I think, uh, that that notion of a privately sponsored refugee where people Canadians can 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 sponsor someone and kind of take responsibility it is a positive thing very quickly about the um, uh, uh, politicians using multiculturalism to gain power um, I actually think it's a good thing I mean, you know what, in, there's three, three main political parties federally in Canada, in English Canada, the Liberals, Conservatives, and New Democratic Party. Historically, the Liberal Party was seen as the party of immigrants, right? The newcomers uh, voted Liberal and so on. I'm not a big fan of the Conservative government at the moment, but um, uh, one of their not so hidden priorities has been what they call an ethnic outreach strategy and the current defense minister Jason Kenney is also the minister of multiculturalism he used to be immigration minister and multiculturalism but he got moved to defense and I actually like Jason Kenney uh, because and his nickname in 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 Canada is the little Buddha and part of the reason for that is he goes to every kind of ethnic community event that he can. Like his schedule is packed full. So one night he's, you know, going to a Vietnamese community event. Another night he's going here and there. And he's making outreach and he's making, uh, and he's reaching out to communities. And even though it's clearly for, to, to gather votes, I think that uh, to increase people's feelings that they can participate in Canadian politics, is actually a good thing. So, and and people have sort of criticized him for that, and criticized the conservatives for that. But I think that uh, even though you can sort of be cynical about it, that if it does increase political engagement, uh, that's not a bad thing. 
So okay, thank you. I I would just add a small thing on the refugee. If you come back to historically, uh, not. So far, so, so far than 40 or 50 years ago, uh, Canada was terrible with refugees. They refused to have the Jews, for instance, after the Holocaust. So actually, there was no policy of refugees, and it was a terrible one. And the, the one that is the so-called uh, individual sponsorship is really dumping all responsibility of a so-called welfare state on the individuals to get uh, them to come if they can uh, gather uh, enough people. So I think our policy, uh, uh, maybe abroad we see it as an open policy. Actually, it's not an open policy. It, w it was terrible. So in a way, I just wanted to, uh, to give my uh, little uh, critique uh, on, uh, to your rosy picture. So, Svetlana, uh, are you passing? It's we okay. We have to go. Food okay. is getting cold. All right. So, but thank you, you answer, all. Uh, Jack, in private, okay? Uh, we are all heading to the library. There is uh, lunch there. And pay attention. Uh, there is an exhibition of uh, iPhone uh, p uh, photographs of an asylum seeker from Sudan. We took the picture. Samsung, Samsung sorry. <laughs> Samsung. Uh, <laughs> iPhone. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have the opportunity to see this okay. uh, exhibition. Follow me. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you all for participating. Eli, no, Eli, Eli.